Definitely, I don't believe it's genetic. If it was genetic, we'd all have diabetes by now. I call healthcare, it's not healthcare, it's sick care. You know, insurance is designed to keep you sick. They love to pay for drugs and surgery and hospital visits and all that kind of stuff, but they don't like to pay to get you well. I tell people all the time, cholesterol is not the bad guy. Mm -hmm. It's the triglycerides that are the bad guy. If you keep those triglycerides down, which a keto carnivore is going to definitely keep your triglycerides down because the triglycerides go up with carbs. They don't go up with protein or fat. You keep those triglycerides down, you're going to be healthy. I don't care if your cholesterol is 250 and your LDLs are 180 or whatever. I'm not worried about those numbers because those aren't the predictors for heart disease. All right. Good morning, everybody. Happy, uh, what are we on, Tuesday morning here. Today we have uh, Dr. Dale Kelly with us. Uh, Dale, thank you for being here. Can you hear me okay? I do hear you. Great. Thanks for having me. Wonderful. Um, where, where are you located? What part of the world are you in? So I'm in uh, Reno, Nevada. Okay. Okay. So not too bad down there. So I'm, I'm up in Washington State. Well, thank you for doing this and taking the time. I guess the first thing I'll just ask you is just kind of give us a little bit of your background for people that, that haven't heard of you before, don't know, know what you're up to. So can you kind of... Tell us a little bit about yourself. Sure. Yeah. So um, I'm a, a chiropractic physician uh, by trade. Uh, my specialty is functional medicine now. Uh, my story started back in 1988, right after I graduated from chiropractic college. I was a young doctor. I was like 30, 31 years old. Had four little boys at home. And I started losing energy one day. Couldn't figure out what was wrong. Went to my family doctor. He did a couple of basic blood tests, said, there's nothing wrong. You must de- be depressed. Let's put you on antidepressant. I go, no, that's not the problem. There's something else going on. We just haven't found it. So thankfully, he sent me to an endocrinologist in town. He did a couple of other blood tests. And long story short, found out that I had a brain tumor. Mm-hmm. Um, and that brain tumor was affecting all my hormone levels uh, it was a, uh, what's called a prolactoma. So I was producing too much prolactin. Uh, I was tell, I joke with people. I said, I was making enough prolactin. That I could have nursed the whole neighborhood. That prolactoma was messing up my life. It was putting pressure on my optic nerve, affecting my vision. And they told me at that time I had two options. Uh, number one, I could do surgery and try and cut that out and not have any complications, or I could be on medication that I would be on for the rest of my life. And with four little boys at home, I elected not to do the surgery and risk that. And so I started on the medication. And after a couple of years of all the side effects of the medication and not getting any better, they were adding more meds and I just wasn't getting anywhere. What was so, it? What, what medication? I don't even, I don't know what they use to suppress oh, man, a black. I don't even remember. It's so long ago. This is like 30 something oh, years okay. ago. I can't okay. remember what it was, but um, yeah, I forgot the medication. So uh, after a couple of years of doing the meds, I said, I got to do something different. So this was back before Dr. Google was ever around. I went up to the medical school library here in Reno and started researching this tumor and everything I could about it and found after about six months of research that there might be some nutritional deficiencies that uh, might be affecting that tumor. So I did some additional blood tests on myself, found out I was deficient in a few things, changed up my diet, changed up my supplements to what the lab said I need to be doing, not what Dale said he need to be doing. And within six months, I shrunk that tumor more than 50% and uh, balanced out all my hormone levels, was off the medication, and I got my energy, got my life back. And that was the life-changing moment in my life that uh, directed the way my practice went from there on out. I went from a basic chiropractic practice to what today is known as a functional medicine practice. So when you had this prolactinoma, were, were you already in within your medical practice or in medical you yeah, know, in I training? Yeah, I was just about two years in practice. And okay. we just started from scratch, just came back to Reno after chiropractic college up in Portland, uh, came back to Reno and just started from scratch. And then um, you said it shrunk 50%. How did, was there some way to CT scan or how did you guys figure that yeah, out? Yeah, we're doing MRIs. We're MRIs, doing okay. MRI contrasts and uh, watching the progression of it. And it's been a few years now, but I test my blood every six months and look at hormone levels. Um, my testosterone is in the normal healthy ranges, like 820 was my last one. And I'm 63 years old. Mm-hmm. Um, so, and my prolactin or my prolactin levels are like under 10. So uh, they're doing great. And I don't know the, I don't know enough, enough about prolactinomas to know the natural 
you know, the natural course. I don't think they're malignant from my, my understanding. They probably just cause a lot of local local destruction because they get big and, they, you know, they press on the, you know, the, the optic chiasm, I imagine. And then, right. but do they, do they spontaneously go away on their own normally? Or is it something in the literature Not that, that I've ever about? read about? Okay. No. Okay. So I credit to changing up the diet and doing the right thing. So, so what, so the question would be, well, what did you do? I mean, <laughs> cause for all the people out there with plaquenomas, <laughs> I'm sure there's not that many, but I mean, what, what do you do? How do you figure out what to do at that point? Yeah, so it's not a very common tumor, but yeah, what I did is I went back, this is the early 1990s now, paleo diet was just starting to come around. And so mm -hmm. that's kind of where I migrated to, was cutting the bread and the pasta and stuff out primarily, um, and just change up my diet. Um, vitamin D was a big part of that. Uh, my vitamin D levels were really, really low, and getting my vitamin D levels up in the 80, 100 range, uh, made a huge difference, I believe, along with just some basic supplements. So you said, you said 180, you said vitamin D level over one at 180 million. No, no, 80, 80, oh, to, 80, 100. Oh, 80 to 100. 80 okay. to 100. Okay. Yeah. That's, gonna... that's what I shoot for. Okay. Okay. I was going to say 180 is pretty, pretty up there. Yeah. No, yeah. no, no, not 180. Got it. Okay. So, I mean, obviously that impacted, you know, I guess it impacted how you, you practice. So, uh, as a chiropractor and, and, and you know, the, the thing that I've always been impressed with a lot of chiropractors, they're open to nutrition as a, as a, as a component of disease. Whereas us allopathic guys were like, yeah, you know, here, here uh, what surgery can I do for you? Cause that's how we get paid. I mean, honestly, we don't, right. we don't really get paid right. by nutritional counseling. I mean, it's like, it's basically a waste of time as far as hospitals are concerned. Cause you're not going to make any money on that stuff. So how did you, so how did that, when did that start to impact your practice? I mean, was it immediately or did, did did you sort of evolve into that? Yeah, so it was kind of an evolution, but, you know, in chiropractic school, you know, we were a little bit better than the allopathic doctors. You know, at least we had a year of nutrition, you know, one class a, a year where most allopathic doctors have about an hour of nutrition as far as I understand. Yeah. So, but it still was not enough. In fact, I always joke, you know, when I took my boards, uh, when I graduated from school, uh, back then we had several we had eight sections or so i think of boards uh, in nevada and uh, i missed the nutrition part by two points um and so i had to wait six months and retake the test now that's all i do is nutrition work uh so my practice you know went totally from not caring anything about nutrition to where that's 99 percent of my practice now um, but it evolved over time as I got more and more, as I learned more and I started going to seminars, I said, I started following all the crazy doctors that were doing things outside the box, you know, not just treating with drugs and surgery type stuff, but uh, actually working with the patients, helping them find their root problems and start correcting those. So I followed, you know, medical doctors and osteopaths and homeopaths and acupuncturists and chiropractors, anybody who was doing something outside the box, I wanted to know what they were doing to help their patients. It is definitely when you when you step outside that that allopath allopathic you know farmer for everyone you know system way of thinking you're automatically sort of put in this box of your you know you're crazy or something like that or you're a quack or stuff stuff which is kind of you know it's 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 interesting to see but I think we're I think more and more people these days are realizing that maybe the other stuff is a quackery where you you know you constantly put people on drugs for problems that probably don't need drugs in many cases. And so, so most of us think about chiropractors, you, you go for an adjustment, you know, you get a spinal adjustment or something like that. And that's what we go for. How does that work in your practice? As far as, I mean, you said you mostly do nutrition. So how does your practice run these days? What are you seeing? Well, what kind of patients yeah. are you seeing? So most of what I see today is type two diabetes patients, autoimmune thyroid, Hashimoto's, Graves, these uh, other autoimmune conditions like lupus and MS, those types of patients. That's 99%. I adjust. I have a couple of old patients from 30 years ago that I still adjust, but primarily my practice is all functional medicine. Long before COVID ever came around, I started working with patients remotely across the country. So I've been doing telemedicine for years uh, with patients from coast to coast. Um, I very rarely see people in my office, even my local in-town people. We do everything via Zoom mm. uh, with them or whatever, so they don't have to make trips across town. So. Got it. So, so you're doing a lot of remote work, and you're, yeah. you're doing – obviously, if you're not seeing them in office, you're not doing adjustments on the vast majority of people. So you're, right. you'd definitely be an outlier among chiropractors, I would assume, I imagine. Most oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. And there's a group of us. I mean, in my, I go to the functional medicine conferences and it's really cool to go to those now, you know, cause it's a combination of chiropractors and medical docs and nurse mm-hmm. practitioners and health coaches and just all kinds of different varieties of people at those conferences. So it's really cool to see the different specialties out there that are migrating to this functional medicine field. So what and you said, diabetes, you know, Hashimoto's thyroiditis, uh, you know, other autoimmune conditions. How are you handling, I guess, just walk you through like your typical diabetic. What do you, what do you do with those? that person comes in type two diabetes, overweight, hypertensive, you know, on a bunch of meds. How do you handle those folks? Yeah. So we start with a comprehensive blood panel with them. My basic panel is 75 different tests that we do. Uh, it's a lot more involved. That's eight or 10 tubes of blood at the lab usually. So we go through that and look at all the different organ systems, see what's working, what's not working. And then I don't have like a diabetes program that everybody does. I have Robert's program or Susan's program because everybody is different. Mm -hmm. And so we just customize diets and I don't start everybody on a carnivore diet. Uh, That's a huge leap from going from a Mm -hmm. standard American diet. So we'll go more to like, hey, let's just start with it. Let's just cut the bread and stuff out. We'll start more of a paleo type thing. And then I will gradually convert them over to, you know, a keto slash carnivore slash, and even in those worlds, we customize the diet depending on that person. Uh, We do some basic supplements. I don't do a ton of supplements with people, but some basic supplements uh, depending on what their labs show us. And then we just help them, you know, as they get healthier and healthier, I say, okay, now you need to talk to your doc about cutting back on your insulin because your glucose numbers are getting too low. Or you got to cut back on your metformin or your high blood pressure meds or whatever it is, uh, because you're starting to get too healthy for those meds and they're starting to work too well. Yeah. Yeah. Fair enough. And, and, you know, I, I, you know, the point is, and I see it too, not everybody needs to do a carnivore diet. I mean, we have obviously a lot of people in this, in this group that are doing that, but not every single person needs to go to that level. Uh, But many people do. And many people find it's, it's very uh, health giving to them. How has your dietary approach evolved over the years? Because you started, you know, paleo was, you know, 1990s, you know, early 2000s, I think is when it started coming into vogue. And then ketogenic diets got a kind of a, a resurgence after that. And, and just in the last, I don't know, five or six years, the carnivore thing has kind of uh, been been more and more utilized. How did your diet evolve over time and why, why did it evolve? Did you find that, that, that there were... Uh, additional improvements in certain patients with with different diets? Oh, yeah, definitely. And even in myself, you know, I did that paleo thing for a while. And, you know, I would make smoothies every morning, these big old green smoothies, throw half a bag of spinach in there and with some protein powder and stuff. And I would always have a stomach ache and I couldn't figure out, man, this is supposed to be good for me. Why do I have a stomach ache every day? And, you know, finally, I realized, hey, maybe it's not so good to have all this all this rough greens and stuff in there every day. And so I started migrating away from that. You know, when the keto started coming back into vogue, we were at conferences and talking with different uh, guys and they say, Hey, you need to try this keto. And so I would try, I always experiment on myself before I experiment on patients with, you know, diets or fasting or anything else. I would do multi-day fasts on myself. And then I had introduced it to patients. Um, I would do the keto diet, and then I'd introduce it to patients. So just as I learn more and more all the time, I, my diet has changed myself and uh, it's also changed with the patients. And if something doesn't work with one patient, then, Hey, I got four or five more variations of this diet that we can try on you to see what works. Yeah. I mean, I'm just, I'll just comment on the, on the kale and protein smoothie. I mean, I guess Lauren Cordain, you know, would, would probably submit that, that the paleo people weren't eating smoothies, you know, at all. So, I mean, it's kind of like, you know, you hyper blend up all this concentrated kale juice, which I don't think this probably doesn't taste very good to start with. But anyway, let me ask you, you said that you, you know, use a limited amount of basic supplements based on on certain labs. Can you kind of talk to us a little bit about that? I mean, obviously somebody's low vitamin D, maybe give them vitamin D, but what kind of things are you looking at typically? There's some people say like all autoimmune diseases are related to vitamin D deficiency. I don't know if you're seeing that within your practice, but what are you seeing that that would would cause you to say that you needed to supplement this or that? Well, um, vitamin D, I mean, I've tested in 30 plus years, I've tested one person that 
had a what I consider normal vitamin D above 60 mm-hmm. that was not taking a vitamin D supplement. I mean, everybody that I've ever tested has low vitamin D. So I don't know if that's the underlying cause of, you know, everything, but um, I don't think it is. But definitely vitamin D is one of the things that we put people on. I use a combination omega that's a plant and uh, animal based omega as some basic omegas. Uh, if somebody has diabetes, I have a couple of different glucose support supplements that we use temporarily on them. Uh, nothing I use is long term other than things like vitamin D, omega, maybe an omega. Uh, everything else is kind of just customized for that person. Do you see any particular, because you mentioned about it, no one's above 60 unsupplemented, you know, rarely is maybe the normal level isn't that high or something. I mean, you, you can make that argument, you know. Yeah. What common things are you seeing with, say, say, an autoimmune patient? You know, I mean, I mean, a lot of them have some, I think, some similarities. I mean, do you find, I think you talk about this, you know, gut permeability issues. Are you finding that to right. be common in any of these people? And, and if so, oh, yeah. if so, how do you both diagnose it and, and then deal with it? Yeah, definitely, you know, the term leaky gut, uh, we use that a lot. Uh, most of my patients have gut issues when they come to see me, whether it's constipation, diarrhea, heartburn, whatever. Those are all symptoms of that leaky gut. But uh, addressing the leaky gut, uh, inflammation, inflammation is the big underlying driver of all these chronic diseases. And so addressing that chronic inflammation through diet, through supplementation is big, addressing that leaky gut. I believe the Roundup and the gluten and the lectins and all those things just really irritate the gut. And so the less of those that they have, the better their gut's going to heal. Yeah, I mean, we get the the glyphosate, you know, to at least some levels. I mean, I think I think something like I saw today where something like 90 plus percentage of, of Americans have detectable glyphosate in their urine now. And, and that's obviously right. coming from the environment um, and how much it causes damage. And a lot of people say it doesn't damage mammals in a way because we can excrete them, we can metabolize it, but, but it, it does seem to have an impact on the microbiome, which uh, again, has a secondary f- impact on us. Are you able to assess gut function? I mean, in any way, are there any tests you use? I know there's some people use a PEG 400, which is polyethylene glycol, uh, to, to assess permeability, but are, are you able to assess that or is it just symptomatic? I go more by symptoms. I don't put a whole lot of weight on those tests. Um, I think there's a lot of false negatives and positives out there and those a lot of those weird tests. And so I don't put a whole lot of emphasis on those. I go more by the basic blood panel, you know, the CBC, you know, if you have high eosinophils, it could be an allergy, it could be a parasite, it could be some gut issues going you know, there's a couple of others, inflammatory ferritin and a couple of other CRP and those things give me clues that, yeah, this person has some inflammatory problems and it's probably more gut related. And so I just kind of side on the, oh, what's the word? Uh, caution on the side of, you know, I'm just going to go with the leaky gut until it's proven otherwise. It's definitely not going to hurt them by giving them some good nutrition and supplements for their gut. What do you think is causing you know, I mean, when you look at all these people that are sick, and it's it's uh, it should be obvious to every person that goes outside. I mean, there's a lot of sick people these days. I mean, a lot of obesity. You know, we've got f- about a 40, I think 42, 43 percent obesity right here in the U.S. with another 30 plus percent that are overweight. So something like 75 percent of the population is either obese or overweight. Lots of chronic disease, lots of uh, diabetes, lots of high blood pressure, lots of autoimmune disease. What do you think is is inherently causing that? I mean, is there some specific factor in our in our diet or environment that's causing that? Or as some people want us to believe, it's all genetic. I mean, what do you th- what do you think is going on? Yeah, so definitely I don't believe it's genetic. If it was genetic, we'd all have diabetes by now. You know, one out of four Americans has diabetes right now, they say. Uh, But if it was truly genetic, 100% of us would because it runs in everybody's family. But I believe, you know, back in the early 50s or in the 50s, 60s, when the no fat, low fat things started coming around, I believe that was a big part of all this. And then you start throwing the pesticides and other things into it and contributing to that leaky gut, Uh, that no fat, you know, high carb diet, you know, the food pyramid that we all grew up with, uh, I believe was a big part of making us sick. And it's just carried on through the generations because we learn to eat, you know, breakfast cereal and oatmeal and stuff every day. Our kids are going to eat oatmeal and 
for a breakfast every day and it'll just carry on down the generations. Uh, but I don't believe that it is genetic at all. Yeah, I mean, you'd, you'd wonder why didn't why why don't why do we see pictures from fifty sixty years ago and no, there's a very low rates of obesity relative to now. And uh, yeah. I look at the pets that we have today. Why why do we have obese cats and dogs? Do their genetics change as well, or something like that? It's kind of kind of interesting to see. How long does it take to fix people? In your view, I mean, I guess it depends on what it is. When you say, "Hey, cut out the bread, cut out the pasta, stop eating you know sugary stuff." How hard is it for people to comply with that? I mean, do you do you find that, that people tend to not stick to it, or how do you get them to, to to continue? Yeah, so that's a great question, and I use this in my webinars all the time. I talk about what's called the three percent rule, and I don't know where it all came from, but uh, the, what I use it for is they say about three percent of the population is actually willing to do the work it takes to get healthy. 97% are looking for that magic pill, that magic shot that's just going to make all their symptoms go away and they don't have to change anything. Uh, in fact, I was talking to a pharmacist last night, 71 year old pharmacist down in LA, uh, that's still working. And we were talking about the diabetes meds and he's talking about Ozempic, you know, and how in a couple of years from now, everybody's going to start having tumors because it's tumors are showing up in the rats, but they're looking for that quick fix. And he said the Ozempic rep was in telling me, you know, you got to give them this pamphlet about changing their diet. And he said, nobody wants the pamphlet. They just want the shot. Uh, nobody, everybody wants the quick fix. So in my practice, I use that 3% rule. And I tell patients, I said, I don't have a magic pill. It's going to fix your problem. You have to do the work. And if you're not willing to do the work, then we're not going to be able to work together. And so I kind of screen those people out right in the beginning. And I can see it, you know, because I, like tomorrow I have a webinar and I have like 120 people signed up for it. I may, I may have 20 people actually show up for it. And now those 20, I might get four or five people that will actually go forward and do a consultation with me. Mm -hmm. And that's why it takes it back down to that about that 3% mark. Uh, most people just don't want to get healthy. They just want the quick fix and they can keep doing what they're doing. Yeah. They don't want to put in the work. Yeah. It's interesting about the Ozempic thing. And, you know, I mean, there's, uh, it's going to be a very, it's going to make a lot of money for, uh, I think Nova Nordisk, I think is the one that puts that out there. They're going to make billions of dollars on this medicine and we'll see what happens down the road, whether we get pancreatic tumors, which are, you know, you've seen in rats, they, they get pancreatic tumors and some concern around, uh, fat cell hyperplasia, which is generally protective, but except, you know, when the drug comes off, which very often it does, you know, either they can't tolerate the side effects and they're, they're no longer can afford the drug because it's quite expensive. Then they have all these, you know, all these hyperplastic fat cells that, that now have been created. And what happens right. to them when the drug is no longer effective? Do they start to become hypertrophic? And now they become even, you know, they gain even more weight back. And some people have already started complaining about that, that they've seen a lot of failures um, with, with it, with it. So it's interesting to see how it goes, but yeah, it's, it's a, yeah. it's that we're definitely in the quick fix time, you know, give me a pill, give me a shot and I'll just, I'll just proceed along. But um, I mean, you're doing this all online now, but I mean, were you ever doing this sort of nutritional approach in the office? Was that a period of oh, yeah. practice? Oh yeah. And, uh, and I still do. I mean, I see patients in the office every okay. day, but okay. yeah, the majority I see are just, you know, it's just, I love Zoom because it's convenient for me and it's convenient for the patients. Mm -hmm. They don't have to drive across town to come in for an appointment. You know, I just meet them where they're at and they can be anywhere and uh, they still get the same degree of care that somebody that's walking in my office gets. They just don't get that hug at the end of the visit, um, but everything else they get the same. Yeah, there's I just, there's a question from one of our one of our members here asking about, uh, do insurance companies cover the cost of some of this stuff, the pan health panels and things like that? Yeah. So once in a while, they'll pay for some of the blood panels and things, but I, I call healthcare. It's not healthcare. It's sick care. You know, insurance is designed to keep you sick. They love to pay for drugs and surgery and hospital visits and all that kind of stuff, but they don't like to pay to get you well. Uh, in, in even the wellness plans, uh, don't really pay to, you know, work with somebody that's going to help somebody get really healthy. Uh, they're designed the wellness plans. Hey, we'll do a cholesterol test on you or we'll do a mammogram or something like that, but not really pay to get somebody to help you get healthy. So in my office, uh, we don't deal with insurance. I tell mm -hmm. people, well, we'll give you a super bill. You can bill your insurance. They might reimburse you for something. 
but we don't deal with insurance in our office and uh, patients are, they know that up front and they're say they don't care. They just want to get healthy. So, mm-hmm. yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's interesting, you know, like I saw that Aetna had bought one of the major insurance carriers, not Aetna. I mean, I think uh, CVS, the drug, you know, the big drug, drug chain bought it, bought a healthcare company. I'm like, well, that's an interesting sort of arrangement because now you're incentivized to, to have people take more and more drugs. It's, it's, right. it's really is kind of an interesting system that we have in that, in that scenario. So what kind of things have you seen turn around? Like, like, can you give us an example of some of your favorite, this patient had that and they got better type of thing that most people wouldn't think is possible perhaps? Sure. Sure. So, um, type two diabetes is my forte. That's what I love dealing with is the type two diabetic patients because they just get better and better so quickly. You know, you're asking earlier, how long uh, do I work with people? And, you know, typically three to six months, I can help somebody turn around. They're not going to be hundred percent better in six months, but they will definitely be a lot better than they were when they first started. I have one gal and her name is Cindy that we started 2017 in September, 2017. Prior to seeing me, uh, she was told a couple months, months before she saw me that her medical doctors told her in June of 2017 that she was going to be dead before Christmas because mm-hmm. her diabetes was just so bad. She was like five and 600 on her glucoses every day and she couldn't tolerate any of the medication they tried to put on her. She had already had 54 surgeries in her lifetime. She was in a mess. And uh, so she came to see me in uh, September of 2017. And we did that standard blood panel on her. And she was in really bad shape. Her A1C was greater than 15.7. She was in bad shape. So I said, Cindy, you have nothing to lose. If you're going to be dead in three or four months, let's just jump in and see what happens. And so we started her on a program. Uh, her average day consisted of about 400 steps on her Fitbit. Uh, she would go to get out of bed, go to the bathroom, go to the couch, go back to the bathroom and go back to bed. That was her day. Um, and uh, she was in really bad shape. So she started and her glucose numbers started coming down to the three or 400 range in just a couple of weeks. So just changing up her diet and giving her some basic supplements. And at the end of October, she said, you know what, Dr. Kelly, I have a new goal in life. I'm not going to be dead by Christmas. I will have a glucose under 100 by Christmas. And on Christmas Eve, I got a personal text from her with a picture of her glucose meter and a 98 reading on it. And uh, she turned her life around. Today, she has a grandson that she would have never met had she followed her doctor's directives and went home and died. And I still see her five years later. Uh, she averages about 6.2 on her A1C right now. She's on no medication. She does about 14, 15,000 steps a day. And uh, she's just loving life. Yeah, good for good for her, and good for good for you for facilitating that. Yeah, it's uh, it is interesting with the with the uh, diabetics how quickly uh, you know you can improve their glycemic control. I mean, it's a lot of people. It's within days. I mean, literally within days, people are having to come off insulin, and, and, and you know if they're on insulin, you know these types of things. Um, which is one of the things you know we we just got through this sort of pandemic period where there was not a single word uttered about changing diet. You know, adopting a better lifestyle, reducing comorbidities, which clearly were a problem. And, and we didn't see any of that, which I think is an, is an absolute failure on the part of, you know, our, our government and our health authorities to, to address the elephant in the room, which is which is one of those things. I, I don't know the, the, the prescribing laws. I mean, you as a chiropractor, you're not you're not allowed to prescribe or deprescribe medications. Is that is that what I'm is that what I understand? Or I don't know, maybe some. Yeah, that's different. correct. That's correct. Yeah, so yeah. I said you got to work with your prescribing doctor. You right. know, my job is to help you get healthy. Their job is to take you off the meds. Do you ever like send like a, a, like information with the patient to provide to provide to their doctor? Like, you know, hey, we've been following these labs. The glucose has come down to this level so that, you know, the patient gets, how often does the doctor refuse to take them off meds when they probably should? Or do you see that very often? So, yeah, that's really, listen, when I first start with patients, you know, I will give them that blood work, that comprehensive blood panel. I said, you know, go show this to your doctor, show him where you're at um, and tell him what you're doing. And a lot of the times the doctors are very skeptical in the beginning. Mm-hmm. Uh, but then when we do follow-up labs, you know, two months, three months out, and they're seeing these A1Cs drop and the triglycerides drop and the CRPs drop and all these things getting better, then they tell the patient, and I've had like, especially VA doctors uh, tell these guys, hey, 
I can't do what this guy is doing for you. You need to keep doing working with Dr. Kelly because he's getting you healthy. I can't even begin to touch what he's doing with you. Um, but they get a lot more supportive after, I mean, blood works talks across the field, across all professions. Everybody knows blood work and the blood work doesn't lie. And so when they see the improvements, they get more and more supportive. I mean, and then they'll start working with these patients a little bit more on reducing and cutting out their meds. Yeah. And so I'm, I'm just, cause you mentioned, you know, some of your patients, you get to a more ketogenic and a carnivore style of dieting. What directs you and what, what sends you in that direction? Are there particular uh, patients or conditions that, that they're more amenable to that? Yeah. So definitely the diabetics do really, really well with the keto carnivore diets. Um, the autoimmune do really well. I, I was listening to one of your podcasts uh, a couple weeks ago about the gal with MS mm -hmm. and the MS Facebook page and everything. And I, right after that, a couple of patients say, Hey, you know, my dad has MS. I said, well, send him to this Facebook page and you've got to get him on a carnivore diet. It's not going to hurt him and it could only help. Um, I do uh, with a lot of patients, I do a 30 day challenge. I say, let's just do the carnivore for 30 days. You can do anything for 30 days and just see how you do. Um, and then if you're doing good, we'll keep going. If it's not doing so good, maybe we'll modify it a bit. Uh, and find out what works for you. But let's just do a 30 day challenge. Yeah, I, I just want to acknowledge you. You know, you, you talked about the, the MS and, and one of our one of our guests or one of our members, Kevin, who 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 is defeating MS with carnivores, giving the thumbs up because he's been he's been kicking butt with that and MRI showing plaques resolving and he's fun improved tremendously in his quality of life and function. So that's that's really a kind of a cool thing to see. Uh, do you get any backlash from? colleagues community around you i mean hey what the hell are you doing telling people to eat you know not the not a plant-based low-fat diet do you get much of that pushback oh yeah yeah and on my facebook you know i get backlash from people you know don't listen to this guy he's just a chiropractor he has no idea what he's doing um, and i say hey you know ask your doctor hey doc how many patients have you personally helped reverse their type 2 diabetes and if you, he doesn't give you an answer, you got your answer. Or if he says, yeah, I've helped a whole bunch, then say, well, how come you haven't helped me? There is some pushback. And even in, you know, the natural world, you know, the plant-based world, there is some pushback on that. And I just say, hey, I just use what works with me and with my patients. I know, I mean, I've had vegans come into my office before. I tell them up front, I said, I can't work with you if you're not willing to eat at least some animal protein because mm -hmm. uh, you're never going to get better. And they'll go away and then they'll come back a couple of years later. A couple of them come back a couple of years later. Okay, now I'm ready to work with you and I will eat some protein because I know I'm not getting any better. Yeah, I mean, I, I like that first one, you know, it will ha have your doctor post his receipts. How many people has he gotten off meds? How many people has he reversed diseases from? And you know, if you go to most allopathic doctors, it's like none. They never, never even, never even, it's almost, if it's even not even, even thought of as a possibility. I mean, it's like, you know, it's just this ever escalating number and, and types of medications. And when this one stops working, we put this one and we add it with this one. And then this one, I had a, I had a guy yesterday and I did a little consult. He has, you know, pretty advanced Crohn's disease. And he came to me out of desperation and said, hey, look, they're when they want to cut my colon out. You know, they said the meds have stopped working. There's nothing more I can do. And he said, hey, give me a couple months to think about it. And he said, should I try a diet? I said, yeah, yeah sure, try a diet and see what happens. But yeah. the sad thing is, you know, he's had this disease since he was a young kid, 15 years or something like that, since he was like a 15-year-old kid. And not once ever in the course of his treatment did the, the physicians ever suggest that diet had any impact on Crohn's disease, which, you know, as you know, is – a gut disorder, an autoimmune gut disease. And it's like, why the heck right. would food not impact our gut? So it's a shame that, you know, whether this guy's able to save his, 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 his intestines or not, I don't know. But certainly if, if someone had reached out to him five years ago, 10 years ago, probably a much different story, but we don't see that at all. And I mean, I don't blame the doctor. I always tell patients to say, I don't blame your doctor for the situation that you're in. Because they're just doing what they've been taught. Right, they're ignorant. And yeah. they're, they're not taught how to you know, use nutrition to help you heal. They're taught how to prescribe meds and do surgery. And so and if they don't follow that standard of care, they didn't 
they get in trouble by the board sometime. And so they just have to do what they've been taught. And so I really don't blame the docs. Um, I just encourage the patients, you need to find somebody that thinks outside the box and will work with you on helping you get healthy. Yeah, fair enough. It, yeah, I, you know, I, and I, I, as much as I sort of have often vilified the, the 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 healthcare system, the sick care system, I think most of the doctors within it are good people that are trying to do the right thing. They just don't have they just don't have the knowledge, and and the knowledge is you know it's it's you know when we think about most of our curriculums were funded and created by pharmaceutical companies and yeah. most of our continuing education. I just you know I just did all my training for my my license recertification. Or renewal, and it was it was you know two or three hundred lectures. Almost all of them were drug commercials. I mean, it was just it was just one you know here's another drug, here's another drug, and learn about this. You learn about when to use this drug or that drug. And it's not. I think I think le- less than one percent. And I and I intentionally sought out lectures that I thought had a nutritional component or or a diet related control com- component. Less than one percent of the stuff I had actually talked about actual nutrition. It was kind of a kind of a shame to, to see that we just totally disregard that as a, as a, as a profession. So uh, do you find any particular type of patients are particularly challenging to work with? I mean, do you have some conditions that are just really, really hard to fix with, even if they stick to the program, do you think things are that just, you know, I can't fix this? My most challenging patients, and it's not because it's hard to deal with is uh, the hypothyroid patient. Um, because it's usually, you know, they're a little bit younger and mostly female, unfortunately. And I have Hashimoto's too. So I know mm-hmm. a lot about it, you know, so I have the autoimmune, but I don't take any thyroid meds. I don't take any thyroid supplements at this point, but working with thyroid patients, because it's so much more symptom driven than uh, lab driven, um, you know, they're not, it takes longer for them to see changes. Or the diabetics, you know, they see change in their glucose numbers in a couple of days. Uh, the thyroid patients, oh, I don't know if I feel any better. I'm not sleeping any better. And so that's a little more challenging to work with. Um, I like working with them, but they are a little bit more challenging. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of criticism about how thyroid is management. You know, a lot of times you go to the general practitioner, you'll run a TSH. And, you know, if it's up, yeah, you're hypothyroid. You know, they don't really they don't really get much into that. You know, I guess maybe you get an endocrinologist. They'll start looking for some of the other potentially helpful, you know, labs and, and information, you know, um, do you have any other help to help these people? Like, do, do you have any resources that people utilize for, um, you know, like, I mean, it's, it's tough. Cause I mean, a visit, maybe 30 minute visit, maybe an hour, I don't know how much time you spend with your, your patients, but how do you like keep people on board? I mean, do you see them like we're going to see you once a week or once a month or how, how does it usually go with your program? Yeah. So with my program, usually in the beginning, especially diabetics, uh, especially those on insulin, we monitor them very closely in the beginning, because like you said, you know, you can see dramatic changes. I had one guy that was off 250 units of insulin in the first three weeks of starting a program a couple of years back. Um, so that can change very dramatically and you don't want to get too low on their glucose. So we monitor them very closely in the beginning. Um, so we'll do weekly visits with them as they get better and better. We spread those out. Um, and like I said, you know, I do three month programs, six month programs typically with people. Um, and then from there, they may, I may see them once a month. I may see them once a quarter. I may see them once a year, uh, just depending on how they're responding and how well they stay motivated. And I use, I mean, I love your podcasts. Um, I send people, I I tell people, especially when we're doing the carnivore, I say, okay, you got to go watch these YouTube guys. Uh, these are all docs, um, but you got to watch them. And I love their last names because they fit the carnivore perfect. So there's the baker guy um, <laughs> that does bread. There's the berry guy that's yeah. like strawberries and raspberries. There's the salad guy you got to go watch. And then there's the mason jar guy down in Australia that you need to watch. And so I'll give them all these names and I say, just start there and you'll go down a million rabbit holes, but that's what will keep you motivated. And especially your podcast. I love your podcast because, you know, you interview regular people all mm-hmm. the time and their stories. And I said, you know, somebody's getting down. I said, go watch a couple of Sean Baker podcasts, find somebody that you can relate to and uh, listen to those and their stories. Yeah. I mean, it's kind of funny. You mentioned, uh, Paul may you're alluding to Paul Mason. I'm actually, for you guys to know, we're interviewing him today at 2 PM uh, Pacific time. So if you guys want to come back and check out Paul's interview later today, but that is something that I found, you know, I mean, particularly the, just the, the average everyday person coming in, sharing their story is really, it's really powerful stuff because people can, 
kind of relate to that stuff. When you present a bunch of scientific data with a lot of people that can't understand it, they just don't have the background, uh, it's 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 hard to make sense of it. You, you can always relate to another person, particularly if they've got a very similar uh, situation uh, that, that you do. Let me ask you, I mean, your diet, I mean, what do you do these days from your own personal diet? Are you kind of ketovore, carnivore type stuff, or what do you yeah. eat typically? Yeah, so I'm mostly carnivore with a little bit of keto. Mm -hmm. um, I don't like veggies anymore. Um, very rarely will I do a veggie. You know, once in a while I'll do a baked potato or something, but um, uh, it's mostly carnivore, maybe a little bit of fruit here and there mm -hmm. type thing, but uh, mostly carnivore. And I find I feel much better on a carnivore. Um, I didn't do COVID shots, but I got COVID a couple of years ago in January, 2021. And I had a bunch of brain fog and just fatigue going with it. And I wasn't eating a real good carnivore at that time. And when I went back, finally went back to the carnivore, it made a huge difference in my energy levels and my brain fog. And so I said, I just got to stick to the more carnivore type diet because I just feel better doing that. Yes, it's, it's it's interesting how how a lot, and I do too. I mean, that's what I you know I've been doing this for now. This is uh, my seventh year doing this stuff, and and I still continue to do it because I because I feel better. I mean, that's that's as simple as it is for me. A comment from one of one of our guests, Becky, talking about she has Hashimoto's, and she's seen that by working on circadian rhythm, sleep grounding and some other things she's she's been able to reverse her symptoms with that and so and of course she's she does a carnivore diet as well a relatively high fat version one to at, at that at that so it's interesting to see that do people need to stay strict with their diet or can they start to add things back in over time what has been your i mean if, if somebody goes through this sort of i don't know almost elimination phase where you get all this stuff are they able to go back to a more rounded diet for those people that are interested in questions and questioning about that? Yeah. So some people can, I find that, you know, a lot of people can tolerate, you know, I pull caffeine out the first part of their diet. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, I, and they'll ask me, they'll be begging me at about three or six months. Can I have my coffee? I said, yeah, go have a cup of coffee and let me know how you feel. And the majority of the time they go, yeah, it doesn't taste the same. It, I don't feel as good. And so they just keep it out naturally. And so and the same thing, like with bread and other things, you know, they'll do really, really well on the program and then they'll go on a cruise and just totally blow their diet. And they'll say, I just felt so bad. I couldn't wait to get back home and just get back on my program because I know I feel better. And so some people will tolerate, you know, some breads or veg veggies or whatever. Uh, some people don't. Uh, Again, it's just all depends on the person. Let me, I mean, because a lot of people, there's some people that really love their coffee and I'm not, I've never, I never liked coffee, so I never drank it. So I can't, I can't exactly sympathize with them because I just never experienced the the joys of coffee. To me, it just, it just, I had one cup and I thought it was awful. And I just said, that's, I don't want this stuff. But why, why, why are you so uh, adamant about removing coffee? What do you think it does? Negatively. So in the in the beginning, I think it puts a lot of stress, especially on the adrenal system. Um, and so we pull it out just to give people the best chance to start the recovery process. In fact, when you do an adrenal test, if you're testing cortisol, uh, caffeine will actually spike cortisol. So mm -hmm. when they do the test, we have to take the we have to take the coffee out so we can get an accurate reading on their uh, saliva test. And so I said, you know, you see what caffeine does, you know, because I'll have somebody cheat and they'll do their coffee and they'll have a huge spike midday in their cortisol when it should be going down. And I say, as you can see here, what coffee is doing to your uh, stress system. And so let's take it out for a while. And that, not for everything, but for right now, until your body heals, we need to pull it out. And then we'll see how you respond once we put it back in. One of the, you know, let me ask you this because, you know, one of the criticisms to low carb diets in general across the board is that it is, you know, it's, 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 it, it raises serum cortisol or in your case, you're testing salivary cortisol, but is that what you see over time? Cause I thought my, my understanding is it, it, it maybe initially goes up and then it sort of re re returns to normal. Um, what is your experience with that? Or do you, yeah. do you serially test this sort of thing? Yeah. I mean, I regularly test cortisol and I have not seen that in, my follow-ups with patients. Usually when I first test patients, they are like flatline low on their cortisol. Just throughout the day, we test four different samples throughout the day in the saliva. And they're just like flatline low all day long. Um, what's called stage three adrenal fatigue. 
But after we work with them for a while, then their morning cortisol, which should be the highest number in the first place, is in the normal healthy range and mm-hmm. it naturally drops off throughout the day. Uh, but I don't see the huge spikes in the cortisol doing a low carb. Yeah, that that is, uh, I mean, it's an interesting Serum cortisol can be too low as well, and you can you can also have problems with with you because know, we like all these things. We need some degree, and it's like none of these things should ever be zero. Glucose should never be zero. Insulin should never be zero. Cortisol should never be zero. I mean, there's you know that there's you know there's there's reasons why we have these things in the first place, and there's this sort of physiological fluctuations that that, that normally occur for many things. You know, outside of diet. Because you talked about that. I mean, anything else? I mean, you you talked to Step Count about this one, you know, late lady that was really, you know, basically, you know, just about dead. And I mean, are you are you sleep exercise? How do you do with those things? And do you prescribe those? Yeah, definitely sleep. Uh, when you're sleeping, that's when your body heals. So we definitely talked a lot about sleep with patients, helping them with different sleep habits, not eating so late at night, you know, not watching Netflix on their tablet all night long, those types of things. As far as exercise goes, a lot of my patients, when we first start with them, uh, they're really, really sick people. And I tell them, you know, exercise right now is kind of going to be the worst thing for you. Um, You know, you can walk around the block type thing, but no going out and doing high intensity exercises or lifting weights or that kind of stuff in the beginning. As you get healthier and healthier, then yeah, we'll definitely incorporate more exercise in because I believe exercise is essential to keeping you healthy, keeping those muscles strong, keeping the protein in your system. But uh, in the beginning, we a lot, most of my patients, we cut out the exercise because they're just so sick. Yeah, it's something that you know. I you know I, I don't disagree with that. I think a lot of people. I, well, well, I am absolutely a huge proponent of exercise. I think everybody should be doing it. But I think in the beginning, you get people that are very sick and have somebody who's morbidly obese and say, "Hey, just go out jogging or something like." They're going to end up hurting themselves, and they're not, it's not going to feel very good. They hurt already, and it's you know you're, right. you're increasing the amount of pain in their life. And so initially, you know, you fix the diet, bring down some of the inflammatory markers. They start to feel better, and then they can start being less sedentary and then they can start walking and then they can start, you know, on and on, hopefully progress to that. You know, let me ask you about protein because that's, that's a sort of a uh, interesting topic in the carnivore space. Some people are uh, like myself. I, I, I value protein. I consume a lot of it. Other people feel that, you know, there's, there's, a, there's, you should be maybe a little lower on the protein, maybe higher on the fat. Where do you, where do you fall on, on that as far as, I mean, do you, are, are, is there a target you try to have people hit for protein? Um, so I don't count protein. I don't count fat grams or calories or any kind of stuff with people. I just say, let's just eat until you're full. And I definitely tell them, you know, the more protein you have, the better off, the faster you're going to get healthier. And especially, you know, red meat uh, in particular, um, I find that with most patients that seems to do better than chicken or turkey or fish. I say it's not that you can't do your chicken or turkey or fish, but just make the majority of it, you know, red meat in your diet. And as far as the fat goes, you know, if you're hungry, you're not eating enough fat is what I tell people uh, and add a little bit more fat into your diet. And the group that I work with, you know, mostly older people. And so you worry about muscle wasting and those types of things. So I highly encourage more and more protein so that they're not pulling the protein out of their muscles to try and keep more vital things going. Yeah. Yeah. Fair enough. You know, you mentioned lots of red meat. So there's saturated, evil saturated fat that's in there and it's going to potentially impact their, their serum cholesterol. Any, any concerns around, oh my gosh, this person's eating a lot of red meat, their cholesterol is going to go up. They're going to be at risk for heart disease. Is that something that you have a concern about or how do you, how do you think about that? No, I tell people all the time, cholesterol is not the bad guy. Mm -hmm. It's the triglycerides that are the bad guy. Okay. And if you keep those triglycerides down, which a keto carnivore is going to definitely keep your triglycerides down because the triglycerides go up with carbs. They don't go up with protein or fat. Um, you keep those triglycerides down, you're going to be healthy. I don't care if your cholesterol is 250 and your LDLs are, you know, 180 or whatever. I'm not worried about those numbers because those aren't the predictors for heart disease. Yeah, I mean, there's obviously people who vehemently disagree with you that are that are more classic lipidologists and cardiologists. They would say uh, it's all about as low as possible. They talk about diabetics now. I think they've just come out with a, 
an updated practice guidelines for, for, for any diabetic, you should have an LDL cholesterol below 70 milligrams per deciliter. And if you've had any kind of family history or an event, you need it below 50, which are these just insanely low levels that have never really been, I mean, humans have never really experienced that over time as far as, yeah. I, for, as far as I know. So it'll be interesting to see what happens with those folks. If we'll see more, you know, dementia events or other, other issues, because our cholesterol has a role in a number of things outside of just clogging our arteries, which, which you know, very yeah. likely it doesn't. But I mean, even as so, even as the role is as in the immune system is is incredibly important, and we saw that with people, you know, with even with this COVID event, people with low low cholesterol had a worse outcome than people with higher cholesterol during the COVID stuff. Now, some people say it's reverse right. causation, and you know that type of stuff, but that, I don't think that's convincingly displayed, but. Yeah. I mean, I always tell people, you know, if LDL cholesterol was so bad, why does our body make it? Mm -hmm. You know, every cell in your body uses LDL cholesterol to make the cell membrane. You can't live unless you have enough LDL cholesterol in your system. Yeah. When you talk about dementia, you know, your brain is, the majority of your brain is cholesterol. And if you don't have enough good, healthy cholesterol in your body, it's going to start pulling it from your brain to make more important things like a new heart cell or liver cell or whatever. Yeah. The counter to that would be people say, well, we make, I mean, we make glucose too. So why is glucose bad for us? And, you know, there's, there's certain, you know, hyperglycemic levels, which we know are problematic, but Dr. Kelly, thank you very much. We're, we're about out of time here. Can you share with us where people would go to find out more? Like if they wanted to book appointment with you or, you know, if you have, if you have some sort of social media presence, would you share that now? Yeah. So the easiest way to get a hold of me is just go to my website. It's drdalekelly.com. So D-R-D-A-L-E. K E L L Y dot com. And on there, you'll see tons of testimonials from patients. You'll see the areas that we focus on. You can schedule a free consult with me, or we'll just get on the phone and talk and see if there's something that we might be able to help you with or not, or steer you in the right direction. Uh, more than willing to talk to everybody that wants to just chat and see if we might be able to help them. Well, good for you. And thanks for being open-minded enough to, to to do this in your practice. And I'm sure you've helped many, many people and will continue to do so. And, you know, I always like to you know, congratulate people for doing that. All right, guys, I misspoke. Our meeting with Paul Mason today is at 3 p.m., not 2 p.m. So I'll see some of you guys back at 3 p.m. If, if, if you're interested for those and in the Australians that always show up with when we have guests from Australia. Dr. Kelly, thank you so much. Appreciate it. Hey, thank you for having me. Have All a great day. Bye-bye, guys. Take care.